morning, I woke up in Nebraska. And uh, that's probably why you see this look on my face. So anyway, um, I had to get a couple of things set up. I, I had the first session at the, uh, at the conference there. And I told everyone, take a moment and, and you know, say good morning to one another as, uh, as I put some things together. And I sat there. And I sat there, and I sat there. There were people that got up out of this side of the church and went over that side of the church, and they were praying with one another and everything else. I thought, where's my, where's my bell? Ring this thing back into order, man. But I, I just told them, it's, it's so funny how, how, you know, when we meet and greet here, it's like 30 seconds, and you look at your watch and think, I, I can't hold up anything. Well, you can. I mean, I'm not going to get offended if you guys are going to go ahead and fellowship and say good morning to one another. So that's okay. Just, you know, I'll keep repeating that. But uh, the Midwest is a different place entirely. Um, interesting. So uh, what I'm going to do tonight is, if you know that I've been, I, I've been gone the last two Wednesdays, we went to back-to-back -back conferences, one up in Wisconsin and then another one in Nebraska. One was a prophecy conference, and they invited me to come and be a speaker. And the other one was for pastors and leaders, and they asked me to come and speak at that as well. What I wanted to do is tonight review. The, I had four sessions, two at each one, and I'd like to do a review of them with you. And just so you, if you ever wonder what it is that I do when I run out of this place, and these are not vacations. Look in my eyes. I mean, Bob and I are both like zombies. So we were, you know, we would leave on Wednesday. Last week we came back Sunday night and, uh, you know, got up Monday morning, kind of staggered around, and, and Tuesday came in and did some work around here, and then we went back out Wednesday to get to Nebraska. And these are kind of sun up to sundown conferences, and I believe that they're really, really important what happens. And so uh, I'd like to be able to share those with you. The four sessions, you know, they were all hour long things. So don't think I'm going to do four hours. I'm going to review them, like 15 minutes for each one of them. So it'll be our normal time. So uh, we're going to do that tonight here, regular time. And then following that, next weekend, we will um, we'll be getting back to Genesis. And, um, and then we'll, we'll pick back up there. Uh, about that, too. Um, Next week we are uh, we're going to be uh, going on Saturday for a memorial. And uh, in case some of you haven't heard, a very very good friend of the ministry, Roger Cochran, passed on Tuesday uh, unexpectedly. And uh, Roger is one of the two pastors who uh, who stood up for me uh, and wrote letters uh, recommending me to uh, to be a pastor in Calvary Chapel. Uh, after Jack had passed away, you don't just automatically take over the church and uh, become the senior pastor and then somehow you're uh, part of the association, you're affiliated uh, as an individual. The pastor, not the church, is the, is the affiliate to Calvary Chapel. So I had to go through those kind of things. And, uh, and he was one of the men who, who uh, signed for me. So one of those guys I'd pick up uh, the phone, he, he became kind of like what Jack was to me, a man who had been around for a number of years and who I could look at as another pastor and, and get a chance to call if I had questions. I'd be able to say, hey man, you run across this? It's always a good thing to be able to, to speak to someone who's been doing ministry for a long, long time. And this is not one of those, oh, poor us. But a, um, a, a, a pastor is kind of a, it's not like you just pick up uh, the phone and call everybody in the congregation and start asking them questions about pastoring. They go, why are you asking me? That's what you're supposed to do. Go ask somebody else, you know? So... Uh, I know some pastors, unfortunately, that, that become kind of insulated, and they, they don't know who to call, and they don't know who to talk to. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes that really messes them up. They don't get a chance to just say, hey, there's other people like me. I can go ahead and talk with them. And uh, Roger was one of those guys, so he's going to be greatly, greatly missed. His memorial, if you know who he is, we uh, went to Israel with him in 2014. He and Jack go back as friends before I even came to this church 31 years ago. So there's some deep roots there. Uh, it's going to be Saturday, October the 1st at um, Pacific Coast, Calvary Chapel Pacific Coast, beginning at 11 o'clock. And uh, I would hope that a number of us made it there to show our respect for a man who had a lot more to do uh, around this place than you may know. And uh, a man who I had tremendous, tremendous respect for and, and loved dearly. Please be praying for his, uh, his family, his wife, Diane. And then, of course, their son, Andrew, will be taking over at Long Beach and his wife, Kelly, and their children. Uh, a lot has just happened to them in a very, very quick amount of time. So uh, we will be praying for them. Uh, next Sunday morning, and I believe Sunday evening we'll have him too. If you guys remember Buck, uh, he plays guitar and, uh, and does worship for us. Actually, his name is Buck Storm. 
That is not a stage name. That is his actual given name. And so he'll probably tell you that. But one of my favorite people on the planet. I just absolutely love him. Uh, he's out here, so we're going to have him next Sunday. Just wanted to kind of let you know about that. And um, the song that we just did here, so interesting. Uh, One day he's coming, you know, that glorious day song. Uh, before I came down here, I happened to see something in the news, which I thought was interesting. And they said they found Jesus' tomb. And I thought, well, my first, <laughs> the first thing that comes to my mind is they found any bones there, it ain't his. So, uh, <laughs> so this guy says, hey. We found his tomb, and here's the proof. There are, there are, they didn't find apparently his, but they found other people's bones, uh, purportedly being Mary Magdalene and the son that they had together, Judah. So they found, they found a tomb that apparently mentions the name Jesus, Mary, and Judah. So this would be like us saying uh, um, Bill and his wife uh, Sally and their son Billy. Okay, it's that common back there. And so that's why I just find it, com you know, it's completely comical. Man always tries to find a way. It is, yeah, so if they tell you that they found Jesus' bones in a tomb, don't believe it. <laughs> he rose again. And the fact that people want to try to make it seem like he was just, you know, your normal run-of-the-mill guy, uh, had his two and a half kids and the house out in the burbs, no, that wasn't why he was here. He wasn't here to have a family. He wasn't here for any of those things. That's what we're here for. He was here to save people like us. That's why he was here. Now, uh, one last little bit of housekeeping, if I may, before we uh, take a look at our text this morning. Um, you know how we like to uh, uh, try to embarrass people for their birthdays, and uh, one of them is my daughter. Uh, she, is, she is 26 years old today, and uh, so we were going to have her here. I want to show her this. Hopefully she'll be here for the second service. If we could pop up a couple of those photos real quick. Yeah, yeah, there she is. That's my little girl. That's like 25 and some change. She was old enough to put her head up. And so it, that gives you an idea of where she started. And then recently we had this next one to show you, just so you can see the uh, progression of this little girl. There she is getting married. And uh, there's Adam and, and that, that guy in the middle with the gray hair. Uh, there's a cause and, and effect here. It's, uh, it's because of the girl in the white dress that I have the hair that's this color. Um, and then there were her years of adolescence. There is uh, one other photograph. Let's bring these lights down so that everybody can see it. This is, uh, this is my daughter in her adolescence. You can take maybe a look at the, the look on her face and you can understand that uh, she had everything figured out already. Here we are at, uh, at the Midway aircraft carrier in San Diego. Brittany was, uh, was doing competitive cheer at the time, so there she is with the curlers in her hair, and she's picked up the phone to talk to the engine room, and she looks very, very put out by it all. Isn't that great? I wish you could see it a little bit better. That's, uh, it, it needs to be a little bit lighter. Maybe I'll do something. So she'll probably be in here for next week. Is somebody looking through the, the door back there? I can see somebody. Is that Mark? He's just looking through. He could come in if he wanted to. But yeah, I just wanted to be able to embarrass her, and of course she's not here. So that's my trial run, and you can, uh, if you see her down the hall, you can say, we saw the pictures of you, Brittany, you cute little baby, and what was up with that thing when you were about 15 or 16 years old? You look like you've, you just ate the canary. All right, uh, chapter 7, we are going to pick up in verse 40 this morning. And uh, we're going to finish out the chapter. I'll have one other photograph that I'm going to show you because it's, uh, it, it's taken from one of our Israel trips. And uh, if you're planning on going on the next one that is next, uh, next March, um, and you have, if you've signed up, great. If you haven't signed up, uh, you need to do that because they're looking for the first deposit to be put in. I'm going to show you a photograph from, uh, from the area where Jesus grew up and uh, or actually where his, his earthly ministry began, where some of his miraculous things, many of his miraculous things took place. But what we had already looked at, and remembering where it is in the context, we are at a place where Jesus has just said the things that he says, and he's at the southern steps. So if we were on the southern steps right now, and you were on those steps looking at me, if I was talking to you, the steps go down towards the south, and that's getting into the city of David, where the pools of Siloam would be. And at the Feast of Tabernacles when this would be, they would go there to draw the water, bringing it up the southern steps to get to the temple where they'd be pouring out the water. So 
that's kind of the backdrop for it. Jesus has just said a couple of things in verses 37 and 38 that has, has impacted the people that are there. And what we're going to find is the reaction of the people and what it was. There are three classes, if you will, of people that we're going to take a look at here. And, uh, and what their conclusions were. There's a very interesting last couple of verses that, uh, that we'll close with this morning that I find really, really interesting. So let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll take a look at our text. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for the power that it has to transform and change lives. As it did with these here, sometimes even the, the words that you will speak... They will cause a decision, and oftentimes it's not the right decision, but a decision nonetheless. We ask, Lord, that you would give us understanding hearts and minds and ears to hear, that your spirit would lead us in all truth as you promised. We pray, Father, that your word would be alive to us, and that uh, when we see the things that are said here, that we would have the reaction that some did, that you are indeed who you claim to be, and that you do great and marvelous things. We thank you for your faithfulness and for your love. We ask these matters in Jesus' name. Amen. In chapter 7, at verse 40, we read this. Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly this is the prophet. And others said, This is the Christ. Now, that's the first things that were said. Look again at verse 37, because these are the only things that are recorded as the Southern Steps uh, thing is, that is being said here. Um, he says, Anyone who thirsts, in verse 37, or if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, of course, he had said plenty of other things. This isn't the first time that he had spoken. But after a number of things being said, he finally makes these very, very straightforward statements and there's a reaction in the people. So after he said these things, the conclusion of some were that he was the Christ and others that he was the prophet. Now notice the other group of people, but some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that that Christ uh, comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now, some of them wanted to take him, but others, or, but no one rather, laid a hand on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees, who said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man has ever spoken like this man. And then the Pharisees answered and said, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But that crowd that does not, but the crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own way, his own house. And then it says in verse 1 of chapter 8, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, what we have here is, is still kind of a repeat of what's happening even in our world today. And that is simply the name of Jesus and who he is and what he represents has this, this effect on people. They may hear little bits and pieces and hopefully we are careful to be a testimony and a witness of who he is. Now, that doesn't mean that just because we speak the truth about who he is or we might read something from the Bible and we do so accurately that everyone's going to have the same reaction. Some people are going to be like those, that they hear what he has to say, put all the pieces together and say, here's my, here, here's my conclusion. He's at this place where they say he's either the Christ or the prophet, and yeah, he's actually both. We'll look at what those are and, and where they're found in the scripture. But then there are other people who only because of a cursory look will say he doesn't check all the boxes, therefore we dismiss without looking into it further. And then you have the other people represented by the Pharisees. That, that doesn't matter what you show them, there's no way that they're going to listen because if they were coming to an understanding and if they were to listen and reach the correct conclusion, then their entire world is ruined. All of their power is gone and they have, they have created such a construct that there's no way that anyone could ever make it past this. They're so religious in their understanding that nothing of any kind of truth is going to have any kind of an effect on them. Now, there's an interesting character here, this man, as we will get towards the end of it, but Nicodemus. Now, this is the second time that he has popped up in John's gospel. 
First time we see him is when he comes and asks the questions the first time that Jesus was there at Jerusalem, chapter 3. Here we see him mentioned again in passing in chapter 7. Now, the last time that we will see him, and it'll be a little while till we get there, is when they go to claim the body of Jesus. And he is there with Joseph of Arimathea. We know him. We hear about him and, of course, claiming the body. But it's a lot of times missed that Nicodemus is the only other guy that's mentioned as being with him when they go to claim the body. So that, that back and forth that they had in chapter 3, I think, is very, very important. So we see these groups of people. Let's go back and look at our text a little bit. There were those who would take into account and they would conclude correctly. Those are the ones that we see in, uh, in verse 40 and 41. So let's look at what it was that they said. Therefore, many from the crowd, that's your first group, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, they said, truly this is the prophet. First major uh, way of looking at him in such a way that they would say, what the Bible has told us about the one who would be coming mentions him as a prophet. Let's take a look at that. It's found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18. And we're going to look at a few of these, and actually we'll be looking at more than just a few. There will be a number of passages that we're going to take a look at. But Deuteronomy 18, Moses speaking and God saying to him, telling him, you're going to go to the people and this is what you're going to tell them. Now, from this passage, from the time that Moses had said it, it had been an awaiting of, of the revealing of this truth. Who was it going to be and how would it come to pass? They couldn't avoid noticing that Moses had said this and from that time on, there should be an expectation. Now, let's dwell on that for just a moment. The people who were there at the time, when Jesus comes around and begins to say the things that he says, does the things that he does, makes the claims that he makes, should bring people to a place of decision, and they should have already been into a place of expectation. And some were, others were not. In this case, from chapter 18, look at verse 17. Deuteronomy 18.17 says, The Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. Now this is God saying, I've heard what the people have saying, said. Now here's what I want you to say to them. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. So here's your first big indication. There is going to be a person who will have the same kind of, if you will, ministry that you did, Moses, a deliverer that I'm going to send to them. Someone who, who will communicate directly to them for me. And not only that, but he's not going to be a foreigner. He's going to come from within your own people. So the Jewish people, the Hebrews, he will be one who comes from among you. And it says, and I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them those things that I command. We have already been through so many of those places in this gospel where Jesus has claimed exactly that. The words that I speak, they're not my own. They're the ones that are from him, and he's sent me to give them to you. And notice what it says, the importance of this. That if there is a rejection of his words, there are eternal consequences to this. So verse 19, And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Now that's a sobering thing to hear that God says when this prophet shows up and he says the things that he says because they are being said at my direction. If the people will ignore them, there is a consequence to it and it has eternal ramifications. So as the people hear Jesus say, again, what did he tell them in verse 37? If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What an amazing thing, because they also know the biblical implication of that. That's not without precedent. We looked at that the last time that we were together, looking at those passages out of Isaiah and other places, speaking about this new life and this outflowing of God through, through uh, this relationship that they would have with him. Now, there was a second group of people, and maybe very, very much the same, that they said these things in conjunction. Not only is he the prophet, but he is also the Christ. They knew, again, because of expectation, that someone was coming. Now, it's an interesting thing when you go to Israel today with us, you'll know that there are many who are there that are still in this place of anticipation, and they are waiting they are waiting for this one that would come, that they would call the Christ or the Messiah, any number of different ways of, of classifying him. But these people here, they knew the passages. And I'm going to give you a couple of very generalized ones, just so that you can look them up for yourself. Psalm 22, because it's a whole chapter. 
And the same thing with Isaiah 53. If you go back and look at those, modern scholars that have rejected Jesus will look at Psalm 22 and they will look at Isaiah 53 and they will try to make it say that it is talking about the nation of Israel, but you cannot help but notice a couple of very important things from this. Both of those chapters are talking about a person because what is done is done on a very personal level. And it's very, very interesting when you consider especially the, uh, the way that this person has been put to death is quite, quite reminiscent of what took place, not only in the, in the way that Jesus was treated, but even the way in which he was put to death. So do that yourself. Read through chapters, uh, uh, chapter 53 of Isaiah and read the 22nd Psalm and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But let's look at one other one that is a little bit shorter and we can understand it a little bit better. Chapter 49 of Isaiah. It's a bit more, I would say it's concise, but I actually want to make sure that I point out and, and, uh, and draw very careful attention. Take your time to read through the 22nd Psalm and Isaiah 53 with great detail. And if you haven't already done it, I think you'll be shocked at just how graphic it is, but how descript it is. Now they understand when they read Psalm 22 or Isaiah 53, these people that are mentioned in John, they would know there's an anticipation that someone is coming. Now look at what it says in Isaiah 59, or 49 rather, verse 5 tells us this. Here's what the Lord says. Who formed me from the womb to be his servant. So what we are reading here is a back and forth before Jesus takes upon himself a body and flesh. This is prophetic. And this is a discussion that the Son has with the Father. So the Father speaking to the Son, the Son speaking to the Father. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, so Jesus speaking to the Father about what his role is, to bring Jacob back to him. That's the reconciliation of the Jews. So that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, and so here more... Uh, the Father speaking then to the Son, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. It is no small matter is a better way of putting it. This is an amazing thing that's taking place. But look at what else it says. I will also, in addition to this work that God is going to do in the nation of Israel through the Son, look at what else is mentioned. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to whom man despises. When you read through Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, you will see the despising of men. It's even mentioned there. To him, or to whom rather, the nation abhors, to the servants of rulers, or to, yeah, to the servant of rulers. Now, we're going to get to the Pharisees, and those are the kind of people that are being addressed here. Kings will see and arise. Princes will worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and He has chosen you. That's the Father speaking to the Son. So as you look at this, once again, as anyone would have read that, look at the people from John's time, any of the people who would have read that would have said, there's going to come a day. No one has come along who could have claimed this title and would have had this kind of, of background, if you will, that God would have attested to. And so here we see it. So these people, when they hear the words of Jesus, they see the things that he had done. They had heard other things that he had said and they knew of who he was. And here he stands on the southern steps and calls people to him. And if they come to him, what will ensue is this, this work of the Holy Spirit that would be something that would pour forth from them. So back to John chapter 7. So many, in verse 40, many in the crowd, when they heard this, they said, truly this is the prophet. And others said, this is the Christ. We've looked at both of those passages, and there are other ones, but those give you the idea. So he's filling, or fulfilling rather, these prophetic verses that really very few would ever even be able to attempt to try to say that they fulfilled, but he fulfilled them in their perfection. And so some have come to that understanding. They take in the information, they seek it out for themselves, they reach the conclusion. Now here is the second group of people that unfortunately 
had they been more careful to look through things, they would have also, as the others, come to the, cor the uh, correct conclusion. Look at the second part of verse 41. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? They can't wrap their minds around this. There's another picture that I take, uh, it was taken in, uh, in Israel. Let me pop it up for you really quick. This is taken in a place called Capernaum. And I love it. That's, that's <laughs> there it is. Capernaum. And this is when you're in there and you can see all the ruins from Capernaum. You can see the, the remnant of the, um, of the first and of the fourth century uh, synagogue that's there. And so you have first century ruins. Now, the thing that's really cool about it, when you're there, if you don't see it with your own eyes, you have to go outside of a gate. It's just within walls, and so they, it's, it's an excavated site. So they, they built walls around it. But one of the walls in particular, when you first walk in, if you're looking at this sign, immediately to your left is a way to walk out of the, of the uh, complex. And if you did so, you're really steps away from the shores of Galilee. So you're looking right at the water when you walk down those steps. You're right on the shores. So when you look at this, you say, this is Capernaum, and it is the village of Jesus. So these people would say, well, wait a minute. He lives up by the Galilee, and there's just no way. So they have not taken the time, and this is much like the people in our world today. They may hear a couple of things, and it's easy for them to try to dismiss a little bit of, of things that they may hear without ever taking the time to look more carefully. And so we already know that from, uh, from Isaiah chapter 9, which we'll go ahead and take a look there in just a moment, but there were these people who had said, we don't want to look any further. We just dismiss what it is because he's from Galilee and nobody's going to be coming out of Galilee. Well, let's, uh, let's look at a couple of things. First of all, the, uh, the, let's take the, the arguments as they put them out there. Has not the scripture said at verse 42... Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David? All right? From the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was. So, let's take a look at a couple of those objections. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Let's go there. 2 Now, if you're new to this church and you say, you know, they spend a lot of time in the Bible. Yes, we do. <laughs> no apologies, because other than that, I'd be entertaining you. And I don't want to be entertaining you. I want to take you through the Word of God because it is our ultimate authority, okay? So that's about as close as you'll ever get from, for an apology from me on this. Um, here, it's 2 Samuel chapter 7, very quickly, um, David wants to build the house of God. Nathan tells him, go for it. Everything that you touch turns to gold. Go ahead and do it. God has to come to Nathan and said, I didn't tell you to tell him that. So I need you to go back and tell him he's not going to do it. But here, to let him down easy, here's what you can tell him. Look at what it says in verse 12. This is Nathan speaking to David in the name of God. Therefore, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, David, when you die, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. Now, he's thinking Solomon. Solomon's going to build the house. But there is a son who will also be born to the house of David, and it won't come through, uh, it won't come through Solomon. It will come through one of his brothers. And so it says, He will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. forever. So you have a short-term fulfillment of this in that Solomon did build the house. But the forever kingdom and the forever, forever household of God is going to happen through another one. And it's going to come from Jesus, from the same tribe as did David from Judah. And look at what it says in verse 14. I will be his father and he will be my son. If he commits iniquity, back to, back to Solomon, I will chasten him with a rod of men and the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy will not depart from him as, uh, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And so it goes on. So there are two parts to this. There is the forever kingdom that is promised and he doesn't put a qualifier on it. He said that there will be one who will sit upon my throne forever. It's not going to be Solomon. Though Solomon would build the temple, no doubt, but the king that would be forever would come definitely through David's line, but it would not be coming through Solomon. It will be a forever kingdom that comes really, it's the clean bloodline all the way through Mary, through one of uh, um, David's other sons, Nathan. 
So you can chase that all down. The genealogies are found in Matthew and Luke, and they take the two different directions, one through Mary and one through Joseph. So there's one of the examples that you can find. Now, I'm hoping you're keeping your finger on John 7, because we're going to keep coming back to it. If you haven't figured that out already, keep your hand on John 7 every time I tell you to turn. Back to John 7. Now, and I'll just give you the quote on this one, because I don't want to run out of time. They say, is he not from the line of David? And so they're not understanding. They don't, they don't know that. They don't chase down his genealogy, which any careful person should. They also say, but he's from Galilee and then Nazareth before that, but he's not from Bethlehem. Well, if they'd have taken the time to understand, Joseph was also from David's line. And he had to go back at the time of the census. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says this. In fact, this is one that I want to see, even though you'll get it on your Christmas cards in about two months. Let's go take a look at Micah. It is very important, hugely important that we're able to look at this, especially for your friends that may be skeptics and all the rest of it. You want to be able to talk to them about this and show the care with which God wrote his word and fulfilled it. Micah chapter 5. And here's why just the mention of Bethlehem is kind of unimportant just if that's it by itself, but it is the characteristic of the one who comes from Bethlehem and who is born there. So, at chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you will come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Now, if anybody would say, well, he's talking about David. Micah's writing after David. So there's no one else that fits this, and this ruler also says whose goings forth are from old even from everlasting. So even if somebody was trying to make the case for anyone else, this child that was born at Bethlehem, Jesus, has always been. He confined himself to a body of flesh and blood and became one of us because we were the ones needing redemption. So he meets all of the criteria from the technical sense and then in the literal sense. He does all the things that are necessary and he does things that only God can do. So back to chapter 7. These people had said, it's got to be from Bethlehem. It's got to be from David's line. Well, he meets both of those things. Now look, as it goes on, has not the scripture, verse 42, said that the Christ comes from the seed of David? We've taken care of that. From the town of Bethlehem, we've taken care of that. And then it says in verse 43, and so there was a division among the people because of him. Now this is reminiscent of what we see in, in Matthew chapter 10. You can just write down the reference. But it begins at verse 34. And it's where Jesus says, I have not come to bring uh, peace upon the earth, but to bring a sword. And if people are going to go ahead and look at that and say, see, there it is. Your God is violent. Look at Jesus is you know, wielding a sword. Read on. His point is there is going to be a division that will take place. So much of a division that it will put father against son, mother against daughter. It, it will divide even families. If you're going to take a stand on the person of Jesus, it will cause, by its definition, division maybe even within your own families. And that's just because you will stand for him and who he is to you at the expense sometimes of your relationships, maybe even in your own family. Read the text. It's very obvious what he means. He never called any of us to war. In fact, when you see the people that were trying to wield swords around him, Peter, remember him? When they came to arrest Jesus and he whacks the guy's ear off with a sword, what does Jesus do? Stop that. Put it away. Grabs the guy's ear and sticks it back on his head. I mean, that must have really kind of freaked him out. It's like, it's, it's attached. How did this happen? Well, we'll get there eventually. That's down the road in the chapters. But I've always been intrigued by that. Jesus says, look, look, this is not it. He was able to say, don't you know when he said to Peter, don't you know I could call legions of angels? I don't need you to defend me. It's okay. But when Jesus talks about a sword, the division that will happen because of taking a stand for who he is, it'll cause, just, it'll cause such a reaction. It happens right here in our text. Read it. Verse 30, 30, uh, 43 rather, of chapter 7. There was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him. Among them were these officers and probably the religious types. But no one laid hands on him. There was a fear of the people. We see this repeated through the Gospels. They wanted to do away with him long before they ever were able to, but they knew that it would create an incident and the people would turn against them. 
So it says, now, then the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? If you look at verse 32 of chapter 7, that's where they were sent. So the Pharisees send them, go arrest him. They show up and Jesus is saying the things that he is saying and people are starting to change their opinions about him, calling him the Christ, calling him the prophet. This one who had been spoken about, he's now beginning to fill those, or tick off, if you will, those boxes. Now look at verse 46. So the officers answered and they said, no man has ever spoken like this man. There's something different about him. We are fearful to do what you've asked us to do. So what we see in verse 47, here's this third group of people. The Pharisees answered them. So these are the guys that are of those categories. These are the guys that may know a whole lot about religion, but they will never bring themselves to believe anything that they have not constructed themselves. And we have those people among us today. Ah, uh, you start to talk about Jesus. Well, I'm a good person. I'm this, I'm that. Well, my church says otherwise. Or for any variety of reasons, people that will so trust in their education and maybe their intellect, they will give you every conceivable reason why they will not believe. They won't look at the evidence. And the scariest ones of all are the Christians, so-called, the ones who refer to themselves as Christians, who are seemingly immune to anything that you show them in the Bible. And they have such confidence in their church that they will never take the time to look at the Word of God. And their church, unfortunately, will speak louder than the Word of God, and they will not apologize for it. Well, this is not without precedent. Let's look at how Jesus dealt with these people on that very matter. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. One of those, again, numerous passages that you could point to where you could see no wonder they wanted to kill him. Chapter 15, and this is heartbreaking when I read it, because I have friends and I have family who are caught in this. They're so, they're so reliant and they're so dependent upon their religious tradition that they believe that there is no salvation outside of a church and not about the Word of God and what it teaches. It's a trap. Look at what Jesus says to these very same people. Really, we are able to look in chapter 7 of what they said about him. Are you guys being taken in by this guy? He's a deceiver. They've referred to him as a deceiver. Well, what does Jesus have to say about these guys? Chapter 15, verse 3 says, So he answered, Jesus answered and said to them, Why do you transgress the commandment of God because of your traditions? The Pharisees. You have your traditions. You know what the law of God has had to say, but you've put all manner of traditions. And he's going to give them just one of, of countless examples that he could give. In this case, it was, how come you're not taking care of your parents? Why are you not taking care of the people that, that are dependent upon you and their age, your mother and your father? And their, their reply was, well, we gave it the office. We tithe, we do this, we do that, so let the, let the church take care of it. Or in this case, let the, let the synagogue take care of it. We give our service there, and we give our monies there and everything else, so it should be a matter for them to handle rather than them. Well, look at what this is. That's not what the law had told them they were supposed to do. They had changed it. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, What profit uh, you might have received from me is a gift from God. And then, he, need, uh, he needs then at that point not honor his father or his mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition, hypocrites, well did Isaiah the prophet say to you when he said, These people draw near to me with their mouth, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. What an amazing thing to be said to the people who felt that they were the ones who could make, him, or make God known to the nations. And here Jesus is saying, let me quote Isaiah for you, because it's no different than back in his time, 800 years prior. That was going on then, it's going on now. You are so filled with your tradition and you teach them as though they are the very word of God. And you do so at the peril of being disobedient to God because you put more stock in your traditions than you would in his own words. What a truth that is today as we see it. 
how Jesus has been made into the image of man, and rather than man realize we have been made in the, we were made in the image of God. And it is to him that we look rather than to ourselves. But boy, are we taught different things. Back to chapter 7, and we'll wrap this up. So, typical of people when they know that they are being challenged, end up bullying and making threats. So at verse, at verse 47, these people come. Look what the officer said. No one has ever spoken like this. The Pharisees answered and said, are you also being deceived? This deceiver, is he deceiving you as well? And then they use themselves as the example. If it was true, we would believe it. Look at verse 48. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But the crowd that does not know the law is accursed. They may be taken in by his deception, but they're not like us. We know the law. Well, actually, you guys wrote much of the law, and you've, you've written your amendments to it and made it speak so much louder than it ever was supposed to. And so they were trusting in their religion. They could not be affected by the things like these other ones who were just saying, wait a minute, we've heard things, we've seen things. It's causing question. These guys were too assured in their own understanding. Look at what happens, Nicodemus in verse 50. It says, does our law in verse 51 judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? And so they answered and they said to him, are you also from Galilee? That's a, that's a shot at them. Oh, so are you deceived like the rest of these guys coming down from Galilee. That's their way of trying to belittle Nicodemus. Remember, Nicodemus, when Jesus was talking with him, John records for us that he was a ruler of, the, of those men, a ruler of the Jews, a Pharisee. So this was no small reputation kind of a man. And so Nicodemus does this. He says, doesn't our law tell us, since you guys are so careful about quoting the law, doesn't our law say that we shouldn't judge something before we hear all of it? And of course, instead of, and this is typical of religious people, instead of actually looking at the argument, they make it about the person asking the question. They answered and they said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And so Galilee is more than just the, the, the lake, or they call it the Sea of Galilee, which is really kind of funny. It's, it's, a, it's a lake. <laughs> uh, so anyway... It's also referred to as more of a geographical area. And yeah, Nazareth would be a part of it. So Capernaum would be a part of it. It's right on the shores. It's that upper part of the, of the country. And it was seen as being insignificant. But that's where the area of Elijah and Jonah were. They were pretty important prophets. One of them was very reluctant. The other one was, was dynamic, but then got freaked out. It's actually one of the funniest things in our whole trip there. On our first full day, we stand on Mount Carmel where he did this amazing, amazing thing. And the prophets were, were just, the prophets of Baal, the false prophets and the pagans were, were shown to be false and wiped out over 400 of them. And then Jezebel, one woman says, I'm going to kill you. And he runs as far as you can run to the south, what we call Beersheba. And we get to Beersheba several days later and you realize, man, we've been on a bus for hours to get to Beersheba. And he got that far away from her just for God to say, what are you doing here? I got other ones just like you. Go back. <laughs> Don't you wish God would let us just get down to the end of the block before he turns us around and instead he lets us run it all the way out? All right, why are you here? Story for another day. So he says, no prophets have come from Galilee. Of course they had. Now notice what it says. And so everyone went to his own house. So all the people involved here, the Pharisees, the officers, the people who heard him, the ones who believed, the ones who didn't believe, all of them went to different places. So what happens with Messiah, the prophet, the Christ, the one who would be giving his life for all of them? He goes to the Mount of Olives. Doesn't go to the house, doesn't do anything else. He's not at his normal home. He's come from the north and he's come to Jerusalem for this feast. Instead, he goes to the Mount of Olives, and we find that he spends an awful lot of time there, there or, or the, uh, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, which is on the Mount of Olives. One of the places, again, that we visit, and if you ever get into the foothills and you think the Mount of Olives is like a really long, long distance, go pick any of the places around here, and if you like to go hiking and all that stuff, just think of a, of a place where you've just got a few hills and maybe like a little wash in between, but that hill that is on the other side or the canyon that's there, it's maybe only a few hundred or maybe a thousand or a little bit more yards away. That's what we're talking about. When he's at the southern steps, 
To get to the Mount of Olives, he's just hundreds of yards away. And there's a little wash in between that they call the Kidron Valley. So, I mean, you're looking right at it. You just take a look to your left, and you're looking at the Mount of Olives. It's that close. So after all this incident, he just goes and walks across the other way. Pretty amazing stuff when you stop to think about it. What I think we want to take away from this, what I know we should take away from this, when we hear the things that he says, when we hear the arguments, if you will, from Scripture, when we take into account all these things, the first thing we should, we should do at all times is hear something carefully and take it to its, its complete logical conclusion. Some people, it was enough just to hear his words and say, he's the prophet, he's the Christ. Other ones needed more information. Don't be lazy and walk away until you have taken it all the way out. Well, wait a minute. He's from Nazareth. He's got to be coming from David's line. Well, he did. He had to be born in Bethlehem. Well, he was. Do some study. Take a look. Open your eyes. Ask God to reveal such things to you. Because the, the shame is that you get so close, but never make it. You won't find the rest of it out. Please don't be like the religious types that say, you can't tell me anything. I believe what I believe. I don't care what the Bible says. Don't be one of those people. Find out what's there. He said plenty. And you're accountable as you hear them. Let's stand. The group's going to come back up. As we always do, we'll have people down here to pray with you, to pray for you if you have any needs of anything. Of course, we would ask that you take a careful look at the Scriptures. And if you have questions about what we've went over this morning, if you want further detail, please come forward. Let's talk with you. There is nothing about the claims that Jesus has made that are not backed up by his actions and his words. Every claim that he ever made was biblical in its orientation when it was said, and he fulfilled it in its entirety. So far from heaven's throne, clothed in human form, you showed the world the Father's love. You gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away for me. Your grace has broken every chain. My sins are gone, my debt's been paid. You gave, you gave your life away for me. For me.
We're all familiar, again, it's getting close to Christmas time. It's weird to say that in September, but we all know. I think they have decorations up already. But in, uh, in chapter 9 of the book of Isaiah, a couple of things that, uh, that we'll probably end up seeing over the holidays of a, uh, a passage. And it begins at verse 2 of, uh, of Isaiah. It's actually, it actually starts in verse 1. The second part of verse 1 of chapter 9 It says, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, which is up in the north, that was the allotment of two of the 12 tribes. And that's the area of Nazareth. It's the area around Galilee and a bit to the west of it. And afterwards, more heavily oppressed by her by way of sea beyond the Jordan. This is speaking about becoming to the shoreline. Look at what it says. In Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shone. This is a prophecy about Jesus. Yeah, born in Bethlehem, but he grew up in Nazareth. And when it was up to him, he ended up moving over towards the Sea of Galilee, just like the passage says here. And if there's any doubt about who we're speaking of here, where you're going to see it in your Christmas cards is at verse 6 of, of chapter 9 of Isaiah. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. We've seen it. The wonderful, the counselor, the prince of peace, the everlasting father, all these attributes that are spoken of him. Let's recognize that everything that he did was with just detail after detail after detail. It was so accurate. And so we see. But I want to make sure that we understand one thing as we're dismissed. It's found in the very first few words of of verse 6. Unto us a child is born... But unto us a son is given. So he's not just any child. He is, the, he is the child of a king. He is the son of God, given by the Father for the redemption of mankind. It's no small matter. This one who cried out on the southern steps and asking people come to him. And if you would, that, that there would be these, these torrents, this water that would for, pour out, this work of the Spirit in them and the idea of being born again. It's no small thing. It's not trivial. If you don't believe in who he is, take the time to look at the claims and see the care with which God has recorded these things. It's not a trivial thing. It is the difference between heaven and hell. It is the difference of eternity. Father, we pray that you would help us to have ears to hear as we come to your word. We ask, Lord, that you would help us not to be forgetful hearers what we hear and that we would be careful to take into account everything that is laid out for us in scripture. You went to great lengths to save us. You went to great lengths to make sure that we would be able to put our trust and our faith in something that is able to be seen and proven. So, Father, help us to walk with you by faith and take these things into account and walk accordingly. We thank you. We give you praise. Thank you for your word that settles these matters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.